Hello my bookish friends out there in booktube land. Have I got a treat in store for you today with this video. By the time you've got to the end of what we're about to discuss, you're going to say, my, that was Uja cum spiff. Yes, we're looking at three ways that you can revolutionize your reading and extract more from the books that you have on your shelf. So let's sally forth. So welcome to Tristan and the Classics. If you're new to my channel, here is where we talk about books, the classic literature, and how to dig deep and get more out of our reading. Now, I said there's going to be three tips to revolutionise your reading in this video, and there certainly will be. Otherwise, what was the point of calling it that? If there were four, there would be some moaning that I've made them miss their bus. And if there were two, well, you would all be standing in the aisles calling for your money back. Of course, there are more than three ways to improve your reading, but these three have the greatest magnitude of effect on reading a good book. For the first tip, you are going to need a highlighter, or two highlighters, or if you like using lots of colours, either lots of highlighters, or one of these pens, which has lots of different colours on it and won't spoil the bedsheet if you drop them without a lid on. Star Wars head is optional. And finally, a golden pen. Why golden? That's so that at any time you can sign a cheque for one million dollars. <laughs> Obviously any pen will do, but I tell you what, it makes it so much more fun and you feel so much more clever when you're using a pen like this. Now for the more astute of you, you've probably already worked out that the first tip for improving your reading and getting a great deal more out of a classic novel is taking notes in the margin and highlighting passages that really stand out to you. I could go into an entire video of how to annotate more thoroughly and more correctly, but that's not the point of this video. Writing notes in a book does a few things for you when you're reading. If it's a book that you're reading in order to grasp a theme, to suck out the ideas of the author, to engage with the author and know their thoughts and then have a bit of a dispute with them afterwards, then writing notes is a way to slow down your engagement with the book, to become thoughtful. Some are under the misguided conception that if they read lots of books, they will get knowledge by osmosis. Let me tell you this. If you read through lots of books, but don't take the time to ponder over them, to weigh and consider the message therein, then you may become proficient at telling stories or improving your imagination, but tussling with large ideas, things that are contrary to your own inclination and giving you a sympathetic mind, well, that will pass by the wayside if one doesn't slow down to cogitate a spot. How does one go about taking notes in the margins? I know many of you will be saying, I've heard I should take notes, but I don't know what to write. And I don't know which lines I'm supposed to highlight. Now, therein lies one of the problems, the word supposed to. I think I've said it in a video somewhere else, but we can often misinterpret the classics as heavy scholastic tomes, only to be understood by people who have heads the size of hot air balloons. That's simply not the case. When we go into a book, particularly the classics, we will discover more of ourselves. We end up walking in the thoughts of another person, which we can only relate to by our own experiences. So there is no supposed to underline this, that and the other. Of course, there are certain things that stand out in a book and probably contribute more to its themes and should be taken notice of. However, you'll find those sort of instinctively. And the more you take notes, the more you will begin to pull the little gems and nuggets and golden dust from the pages. First of all, with a highlighter, I know there's different techniques here, but some have different color highlighters for different reasons. If there is a sentence which you think is rather natty and you would like to remember it, why not highlight it in one color, let's say blue. And then once the book is over, when you think, oh, I'd like to get some of the quotes from that, you flick through the book and you pick out all of the blue highlights. And there probably won't be all that many, but they'll be the quotes that make you smile, bring you happiness, sound good in your larynx, 
or maybe you can imagine yourself at a dinner party quoting I've been bleak house by Charles Dickens this is what I read I thought of an excellent quote other highlighter pens or other colours could be used for instance to keep a track of characters it might be to keep a track of ideas sentences you might think oh I sense that that is a big point or reading it in this chapter this is a significant statement towards the topic the author is trying to develop. So let's say that's in pink. And it's a good access point for when you go back over it to think about the book. Also, something I like to do are sentences which, as I'm reading the book, I sense might be important. There seems to be just this ethereal undercurrent to what's being said. But I don't know whether it's significant or not. And frequently what I'll do is I'll just highlight that so that I can come back to it as the book progresses or at the end of the book and I can start to read into that sentence. And sometimes I find, no, it didn't mean anything. But often, often, trust your intuition, often you will find that it does add to your understanding of the book once you've finished it. What do you write as notes, though? OK, I brought Bleak House for the reason of showing you just the opening pages. By the way, you do not have to write notes on every page. That's not the point. Can you imagine writing notes on this, on every page? Good grief, you practically have written a book yourself. However, some pages are just riddled with interesting information. And to make one's notes, especially at the beginning, gets the mind ticking. You'll see on here, you see writing all over, little, little, dotted notes, uh, underlinings, but all this scrawl here. Do you see what I mean about having a gold pen? It looks so much better, doesn't it? So let me just tell you what I've sort of underlined in here. I noticed as reading the first page that there was the word drizzle, snowflakes, and then in one paragraph, fog, 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 fog. Now, naturally, the author wants us to remember fog. So I underlined it, and just out of a curiosity, I counted how many times. And as I've written here, there are 15 foggy references before coming to the Lord Chancellor, who just comes at the bottom. Foreshadowing one expects the foggy nature of the law. Okay, nothing profound in that, but it's got me on my way to creating an atmosphere not in just understanding the book, but perceiving the author's angle on what he's writing. And I also made a little note about how the description outside Chancery Lane was done. And it was written in a legalistic style. For instance, dogs undistinguishable in mire, horses scarcely better, splashed to their very blinkers, foot passengers jostling one another's umbrellas in a general infection of ill temper losing their foothold at street corners. Do you see the punctuatedness of the way it's written? I just picked that up and thought, oh, that's very clever of Dickens. He's written his description outside a courthouse in legalistic rhythm. Then over the page, of course, it carries on. And we find words like mad old woman, incomprehensible judgment because no one cares. His prospects in life are ended ruined suitor. This constant negative description of people in and around the court who are not lawyers, who are being ruined or perplexed, it's very clear that Dickens wants us to see the Court of Chancery as a place that is foggy and bewildering to the standard person who is in it and is a place of menace and of danger. So we've, we've picked up these impressions and now I'm beginning to form an idea of the angle that the author wants me to come at this book. He has a problem with the institution of the law and as I go through the book I'll start making other notes here and there. I won't just look for things relating to the law because I found that at the beginning but whenever the law comes up I've already been prepared in mind by taking the time to write to always remember where the author wants me to come from. Now later, um, Lady Dedlock turns up, a member of high society in the fashionable elite. Um, nothing legalistic is written there, 
but there's a very definite description of the world in which she inhabits. And so making notes of that helps me. But what happens if you do this is as you go through a book, even though you can't conclude necessarily on all sentences that stand out, you begin to jot down your ideas of what it might mean. And these lines begin to converge together towards the middle, three quarter way through the story. And then you begin to find a real message under the story. And there's this eureka moment when you think, ah, oh, I know what the author's trying to say. And when you go back over all your highlights at that point, loads of things jump out at you and it becomes really exciting. And then by the end of it, you're sitting there ponder, 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 thinking whether you agree with the author's conclusion or whether you're slightly at odds with them or completely opposed to them. But the point is, you discussed the book with the author when you stop to take notes and highlight things. The biggest reason that some of you will not do this is because you want to get through the book so that you can start another book. Get out of the supposition that reading many classics will by default build you up in your understanding of literature. It's taking the time to ponder, to meditate. That's the way to get the most out of the classics. And to stop and write forces you to meditate. Always have your golden pen in hand. The second point is very similar to point number one. It's still to do with writing, but it is not just notes. And you will need paper. Not much of it, because you'll probably turn this into sort of quarters. One of the most incredibly beneficial things you can do to get a lot out of a book, to become steeped in it like a tea bag in water, is to write a brief synopsis at the end of each chapter. Or, if that's too much, every three chapters, if you can sense there's a natural break. Now, what do you write in that synopsis? Well, certainly you don't want to start writing reams of, of paper explaining the story. This is what you're going to jot down. Characters. New characters who come in. You will just make a note by them of maybe a characteristic they have and what you think they might bring to the plot. What is their temperament? Are they proud? Are they easygoing? Are they materialistic? Are they kind? Are they full of justice? Are they easily rattled and volatile? Just make a little note. And then there might be ideas that you see, ah, this person is going to affect the main character. Well, jot that down. I think this person is going to manipulate the character. And as you go through each chapter, when those characters turn up, make comments at the end of the chapter how the characters have had an effect on one another, where they're going. If you find that they're, they've got their own motives and they have their own sub-story, then just quickly jot in one sentence the subplot for this character. What is their ambition? What is their goal? What are they trying to achieve, does it seem, on, on, the, on the stage of the play? The reason you're doing that is once again it slows down and makes you ponder but you will change your mind on these characters as you go through because obviously it's often the case that you have a baddie who turns into a goodie and a good guy who turns into a bad guy. For instance Wickham in Pride and Prejudice when he turns up oh he's wonderful and Mr Darcy is an absolute bounder. However as most of you will have read it you know they change place. So just write down your first impressions and it will cause you again to really live in the moment of the hero or the heroine. As the book progresses, you will find certain ideas coming through the characters and it will inform you of the author's perspective. It always does. So that was number two. Make a small itemized list of characters, traits, and thoughts towards where the plot is going at the end of each chapter. It will make a world of difference to you. Trust me. Don't I look trustworthy? Granted, I do have hair like Jerry Cruncher in A Tale of Two Cities, but I speak with an English accent, and naturally you can believe anything I say. 
which now there's an odd thing why are all the bad guys in hollywood english i mean what is it about this accent what do you mean i can't take over the whole world and blow up australia of course i can i'm british <laughs> The third thing that will revolutionise your reading, if you can bear to just be a little patient at the end of reading a book and not charging on to the next one, is this. Once you've finished a book, flick through your notes. You don't have to read all of them. Look at the highlighted parts. Chew over the ideas of the things you wrote down at the end of chapters, particularly the mid chapters and latter chapters where you see this massive sudden click where a light bulb went on in your mind. And just enjoy your thoughts and try to formulate an idea. Create a clear picture of the landscape of the author's thought that you perceived came out of the book. Then you will find this next bit really enjoyable and maybe even challenging, but in a good way. Go online and find maybe um, a PDF file pertaining to an exploration of the book you've just read. It might be seven, eight, nine pages long and read it through because I guarantee you, you're very susceptible at the point of just finishing the book and looking at your notes to taking on nuanced ideas, which you will have missed. When you come up against a detailed review, it will just add sort of a 3D form, filling out areas where you know there is something missing in your connection with it. And what will happen is you will get an unbelievable grasp of the depth of the classic literature, especially. And when you talk to others about it, and I, I'm, I don't advocate swagger and bragging, but when you talk to others who have read the same book, you will find that most of them will think, how come I didn't get that much out of a book? That's when you know you've done a really good job. Now, you might not like the thought of reading sort of scholastic PDFs or whatever it may be. But we live in the best age ever for reading. We have YouTube. Go online and find an in-depth review of the book you've just read. And by in-depth review, we mean it goes beyond rehashing the plot and then saying, I like this person and I didn't like that person. Those reviews are actually very good. They're great actually before reading a book, even if it's got a spoiler. Um, and sometimes you'll get the slight nugget in there of someone's interpretation, which is great. But I'm talking a good in-depth review. So you're looking half an hour to an hour long, where someone starts pulling out quotes, pulling out lines which they feel are thematic, are able to contrast uh, one character with another, dive maybe cross maybe cross reference ideas from one book with another book. There's a book I've got just here, I've just finished. Stendhal, The Red and the Black, or The Scarlet and the Black, as this one calls it. Now, whew, a bit of a lemon juicer of a book, you know, really gets into the old Swede. There's, there's nothing complex in the way it's written, but it's, it's not the most straightforward book to really get to grips with. For a lot of it, you are thinking, what are the characters actually trying to achieve? I can see their life happening. It's very simple to read, but I don't quite get where they're going. And that can be quite disturbing when reading a book. However, it is very good. Interestingly, on reading The Scarlet and the Black, I found something very particular about Bleak House, which was written after The Scarlet and the Black. There are references in here, or allusions, which I do not doubt come from this book. I'm sure Dickens had this book in mind when he began Bleak House. Lady Dedlock in here is so like Matilde in here. Lady Dedlock is a much older woman and very sophisticated and in command of herself, but Matilde is 19 years of age and is very volatile of temper. But they're both hampered by the same problem in society, despite being the wealthiest. Now, what's also very curious, and maybe I'll do a book review of Bleak House and of The Scarlet and the Black, is the reference to red and black in this book. And can you imagine how ecstatic I was 
when I was reading this and thought, do you know what? Bleak House is similar to this. I must go back and have a look at it. So I was thrilled to find this allusion from one book to another, even though I read them back to front. That adds to your mental library. That adds to your enjoyment of things. That adds that that tells you sort of the life of the authors you're reading and how they were influenced by what they read. And clearly, if I'm right, and Dickens did have in his mind Stendhal's work, then he too was someone who thought over what he read. I read Crime and Punishment at the beginning of the month as well. Guess what? I know Dostoevsky was influenced by Stendhal. On reading Stendhal, The Scarlet and the Black, I can see, when reading Stendhal's work, the ideas he was toying with and the manner he was going about developing the character of Julian Sorel, I can see Dostoevsky's Raskolnikov. Now, they're totally different characters, but I can see Dostoevsky's psychological approach and it's much more fleshed out and, and filled out and rounded and detailed than Stendhal. But I can see Stendhal's influence on Dostoevsky. And that takes me then, when reading Dostoevsky's works, to thinking about a man who probably had sat and thought about a previous author. And that adds an awful lot to connecting the books that are upon your shelf into a universe, a cosmos of a library within your own mind. And that is a joy. It really is a joy to be able to do that and to spot these references to one another. And so that's the third tip. Let's go over them again. Number one, highlighters for things that stand out to you and maybe questions you've got. Pen for taking notes. Frequently, actually, in my books, you'll see question marks. What means this is written next to it for a particular sentence. Take notes. Let your mind develop along with the author. Secondly, also note-taking, write a small sort of bulleted synopsis at the end of each chapter or every three chapters where you're going to jot down the names of new characters, personality traits they might have, if you sense that they have got an agenda or, have an or if they have an effect on the main character, and plot developments so that you can sort of follow the line of thought of the author in the book that will be invaluable when you want to go over it again, especially if you're in a book club. This technique is excellent. And if the book club goes quiet, your ability to pull one of these pieces of paper out of your book can get the conversation going again. And last of all, after finishing the book, do not race on. In another video, how many books should I read? I make the comment that you should never race on from one book to the next, but take the next few days to chew over what you've gone through by looking at your notes and then get an in-depth video review. And this is where I'm going to make a plea to all of you who are watching who have got this far. When I tried to look up an in-depth review for Stendhal's The Scarlet and Black, I couldn't find one. I found an interesting lecture, but it wasn't quite the thing I was looking for. You see, the reason these in-depth views often don't exist on YouTube is because they don't get that many views. I personally on this channel want to make in-depth reviews. For instance, please go and have a look at Tess of the D'Urbervilles review or Far From the Madding Crowd or Great Expectations. I've done these and they're longer, but you'll see how I try my best for you to dig deep and come up with various ideas from the book. Please, this is my point, please, please, if you want to see books reviewed in depth, please hit the subscribe button because it really helps me and it puts something out there for anyone that's trying to find um, a deeper understanding of books that they're reading. And that way I'll also be able to do books like The Red and the Black, which aren't highly sought after, but they'll be useful to people. So if you love books and the classics and want to get more out of your reading, subscribe to this channel so that you never miss another episode of Tristan and the Classics. I wish you joy in your reading.